I spent a very wet spring in Santa Cruz after getting back from Southeast Asia, and that was that 82-83 uh, winter, uh, El Nino rains, and um, I had gotten interested in the subject, uh, the area of what is known as agroforestry. Agroforestry pretty much is loosely defined as some combination of trees and food crops or food production somehow. And so I applied to graduate school at the University of California, Berkeley, otherwise known as Cal, um, in the, uh, their forestry program. And they had an old forestry program. I went and um, I put in an application. I went and talked to them. They uh, said, yeah, listen, we have a um, summer camp coming up. If you can do the summer camp, why? I think you, you know, we'll, we'll accept you into the program because they need, they needed a certain number of students to, you know, pay to get into this summer camp program. So in June, I went up to Quincy. I got a ride with one of the students, Ann Schliske, and started that summer program, a two-month program, which, uh, in which we spend every day uh, from, well, we, uh, Monday to Saturday. Saturday was half day, but uh, basically uh, in classes and then out doing uh, uh, field trips and learning the ropes of forestry. It was, it was fun. The group, there was a group of about 26 students, undergraduates, uh, and some graduate students. Um, it, was, it was really fun. Uh, we, um, we did a lot of social things together. We lived, there were, there were nice bunk houses that we lived in. I, of course, slept up the hill, uh, in a, you know, because I love sleeping under the stars. And we did things like I, I put on a, a dinner. I cooked, I, uh, I cooked up a, a dinner of uh, pasta carbonara for everyone. We had wine. We um, did. Uh, we climbed uh, Spanish Peak. Did various hikes. It was it was a fun thing. That gave me some units of credit. I got back to um, and I had applied to uh, the International House, which is an old um, program building. Uh, it goes back. I think it must have been built in the 1920s. Uh, at uh, Cal, and I got a room there uh, in, the, it's known as the I House, and um, that time I, uh, you know, I got into classes. Um, the thing, I, I, my memories of I House were of uh, being down the hall from a couple of guys who, whose room was right next to the elevator, uh, Joey Ugaretz and Perry Zimmerman. And they were, they were playing the role of pranksters. They loved just uh, being kind of gently disrupting. They had, uh, they brought vast amounts of uh, beer up to their room uh, and um, partied late. And the thing about um, I House that it was probably two thirds, at least two thirds international students who came from all over the world. And the thing, they, they um, just uh, didn't really, I think it probably it took them a few years to learn the tradition of American pranksterism. Uh, but these guys, I realized, were, were you know, fun guys. I, I kind of wanted to do the same thing as everybody else, just completely ignore them and turn, you know, turn my head towards the elevator, get on the elevator while they were in there laughing and joking and throwing empty beer cans onto the floor and finally I just I went in this was only a few weeks after I was there and made friends with them as I walked through you know four inches of empty beer cans on their floor uh, they did stuff just silly stuff like setting up a, a a huge slingshot that would shoot water balloons at the fraternity uh, house across the way um, anyway uh, I'm pretty sure these guys were uh, 
in you know hidden <laughs> good students I'm pretty sure they both got into programs into graduate school and, and did pretty well I'd love to find out um, but something was uh, was keeping me down keeping me low uh, and I had to come back to my room every afternoon and, and just sleep get in bed slowly you know my back was starting to go I was I had sciatica pain I didn't know what was going on. Long story short, they put me into, at that time, the universities all had student hospitals that were still around. It was an old tradition, you know, 100 years, over 100 years old to have um, a hospital on campus for students. And, and these were not research hospitals as they are now. And they put me into the, the old, you know, the hospital at Cal. They put me in traction. That was the old way of doing things, and I stayed, I think, five weeks uh, in the hospital in traction. In other words, pulling my feet uh, outwards, uh, or you know, in bed, uh, pulling my feet, you know, sort of downwards, so that it would uh, allow this disc that had slipped out to uh, slip back in. But it didn't. They sent me to a hospital, Alta Bates Hospital, for surgery, where I had the classic. Um, laminectomy surgery uh, disc um, not fusion um, uh, a disc uh, basically they they just cut the disc um, part of the disc that's stuck out and then sew you back up um, and so the um, Alta Bates is a good hospital one of the things I remember there was the nurses would actually sort of compete for bathing the younger guys who they they liked and uh, one day you know one came in and 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 said you've been bathed you know I guess it was you know on the note and who bathed you you know well Lulu did oh you know you know <laughs> and they were um, you know this was the 80s and they were they they considered you know being good to their patients and um, being good was giving them you know a sponge bath that the uh, guy would enjoy and so um, anyway the uh, the after the surgery I remember going into the surgery and they 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 were going to do what they called um, a spinal spinal tap which in which they they insert um, a needle and they they anesthetize your spine without any uh, drugs um, and so they poke a uh, so they do that, and then they put a needle, you know, they poke your foot with a needle, and I kept jumping and jumping, you know, because it was painful, and so it wasn't working. And they tried it over and over, then uh, finally just said, okay, no, we're going with um, the, you know, the old anesthetics, sodium pentothal, which is, you know, not easy to recover from because it stopped, you know, you, you collect fluid in your lungs, and, and it really, you know, stops everything in your body. But um, I got through that. They had me on um, on morphine, um, you know, uh, drip for two days, and I remember being able to just stare at, you know, the TV and in, in this sort of bliss. Uh, it was the only time I've ever been on a um, a strong, you know, an, um, an injected opiate. Uh, and then when they took me off it and and put me on the uh, the pills, whatever it was, it was probably. Hydro it's probably codeine, either that or Percocet, but it's not nearly as strong. And I remember, I remember going into a cold sweat, uh, and even after just two days of being on uh, the, uh, the the intravenous morphine, so I got out of the, uh, I got released from the hospital um, and recovered at my grandmother's in Alameda. And then went back into school, uh, but I couldn't heal. I just couldn't get better. My uh, and the um, the back pain was still bad. And one day, I just uh, my back started spasming. I was I got back to my grandmother's in Alameda, and I couldn't even move. So uh, I think uh, Grandma or I called my dad, and at that time, Ohio. Ohio, Ohio Sumua, uh, our good friend uh, and soccer coach, was staying at uh, mom and dad's house. 
And Dad and Ohio came to Alameda and they actually had to, I was in such bad uh, spasmodic pain that they had to carry me out on a board to get me into the, the van um, and took me back to Davis. I had to drop out from the, the uh, fall semester uh, at, at Cal and I just couldn't figure out what was wrong. I tried again to go to um, Cal in the spring and that didn't work. Went back to Davis still and at that time I, I wanted to figure out what was wrong. There was something wrong with my health. There was something just dragging me down. It gave me, you know, it was... And so at that time there was sort of this story that you could get candida fungal infection in the intestine. Now candida albicans is mostly, if not all, uh, an, uh, a, an infection of, of women's vaginas. But at that time there was, people were saying that, you know, you can get it in your intestine and that runs you down. And so I went and I, I really, you know, I went to the doctor and I said, I need, I want to be tested for this. I want to be tested. And they said, you know, no, there's just no such thing as, as candida fungal infection of the intestine. But they tested me anyway. They called me three days later and said, you have hookworm. Well, I'd had it for almost two years. I had picked up in, in Bali. I, it had uh, not been picked up on the test that I had uh, gone, the lab test I had done in, um, you know, it was a stool sample, of course, this is how they pick it up. Um, that's how they, they analyzed for it and had not been diagnosed um, in, you know, by the lab in, in Malaysia. Maybe it was just incompetence, I don't know. Usually the tropical labs are better at finding these things, but they found it. Um, they have a standard, you know, three-day um, medicine that they give you that kills it and gets rid of it. And that, that would have, I could have done that two years before, but it's just the way things are. And I f immediately felt the, um, the energy coming back. Uh, and I spent the summer of 1985, um, I went, I rented, <laughs> I put up a tent in the backyard of a house uh, on L Street. I paid a certain amount of money to be able to use their bathroom and kitchen. And I went to the weight room every single day for two hours. And I just built myself back. I got myself back. And I also um, then applied to transfer to the graduate school uh, in agro and ecology at uh, UC Davis. It takes a long time after having something like that parasite for two years. It takes a long time. I remember I did a backpack trip um, extending uh, the uh, at the end of the southern end of the John Muir Trail. I went. I continued. No, excuse me, at the northern end, I continued north uh, backpacking and um, through uh, a pretty isolated part of Yosemite at that time. Uh, but I was, I was still underweight. I was still not up to par. And I uh, remember that, that quite well. Back in those days, backpackers used maps from the U.S. Geological Survey, their topographical maps that were all done in the 1950s. And by this time it was the mid-1980s, and I was using one to get down, and then I, I needed to get off of the, 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 the trail. It was actually the Pacific Crest Trail that went north at the end of the, uh, the Muir Trail, and uh, at Towards the end, I think I had been eight or nine days, I needed to get down um, to uh, resupply. And that was, it was um, the trail going down to lakes. Um, and, and so I, I used the map and started down. It was a couple of thousand feet uh, down a, 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 uh, an elevation. And, and as I started down, I realized that the trail that showed on the map, this 1955 map, topographical map, had been abandoned. 
and, and, other, and, and not maintained because it was steep. And I was probably halfway down and having to scramble down these steep, um, almost uh, cliffs uh, to get down. And um, that has happened to me twice. It happened to me again in 2009, 2008, when I was up in, when I uh, went into the wilderness on a hike uh, in Los Padres National Forest. I was using a, an old map and had uh, gone on a trail that was well marked in the old map, but had been abandoned because of, of the steepness and difficulty and the, the, the expense of maintaining it. And so the, that was that first one coming down from the Pacific Crest Trail was one of those experiences that um, was memorable and uh, kind of kind of scary. I had to keep my cool because uh, being alone up there with no way of communicating, uh, if I had you know fallen and, and gotten hurt and immobile, I would have um, would have died up there. And so that's just part of uh, going solo and going. Uh, I wasn't in the habit of going off trail when I was backpacking by myself. One of the things that I started when I was on the Muir Trail was I carried a songbook for Cam. I would get this songbook out and I would sing. And after a while, I would have the words of some of the songs memorized and I would sing those songs on the trail. And on the subject of going off trail, alone a friend actually the brother of a guy i grew up with the brother of ross quick in davis the older brother he also loved to backpack and he went out and backpacked he had a dog with him and he went off trail he fell apparently something happened he fell and a boulder apparently trapped him or he broke a leg so he couldn't move and he died of probably dehydration and um that's the reason i tried to never go off trail when i was solo additionally i think the dog gave him a false sense of companionship and security because the dog did not know enough to go get help and additionally i was weak i was still weak and underweight from uh this recovery i was going through and so i uh, had to be especially focused and had to you know, uh, push uh, back on any uh, uh, tendency, any any feeling of, of panic or anything. You have to do that up in the when you're by yourself, off trail in the wilderness, in a situation like that. So back in Davis, I was still interested in. I still wanted to do agroecology. Uh, UC Davis has the top programs in the programs in, in both agriculture and ecology, uh, top programs in the world. I mean, in, in, in agriculture, the UC Davis trades off with um, Wageningen in, in Holland, uh, you know, and is being number, world number, number one in the world in agriculture. Um, and it really depends on the department and, you know, what program, what lab you're in, et cetera. And then in, in ecology, you, uh, UC Davis is, is also uh, the top program. They are very, uh, they're well known for quantitative, um, you know, sort of modeling of ecological systems. But a number of us had applied and gotten into the ecology program to study agroecology. In fact, so, so many people were interested, and so many of us were doing that already because that combination of the you know top school in ecology and top school in agriculture you put those together and you have agroecology that they actually uh, they they asked us to help them put together a what they call a uh, a sub um, program in ecology a, a sub uh, special specialization in um, agroecology and so we we got together with the the uh, the faculty and we helped them put together the, the, the uh, criteria, the classes and the areas that would be needed um, to, uh, for this program in a, a sub-specialization, robotic ecology, and then there was, an, you know, say, a, these differences that you could um, do. The, the uh, environment of trees and crops, the micro-environment, and this entailed 
the uh, the uh, fertility, soil nutrition, but also the known as the biometeorology, the the amount of sun, the amount of of heat uh, under under trees in the environment where I had I had worked. I finally found a photo of the field situation in 1982 that set me off on this path to agroforestry. This here, this tree here, is an acacia tortillus. It was just outside of the sprinkler zone that we were using to determine the drought status of these crops. And the sprinkler is, it went from zero to a very well irrigated. But there were beans under this tree that were completely unirrigated. And outside of the canopy of the tree, the beans did not survive. But they were doing well. They were growing under the canopy. And I decided that I wanted to look at that situation, the microenvironment plus the soils. Uh, of course, you have leaf fall and you have the soils higher in organic matter under these trees. And you can see the canopy of the acacia tortillus is a flat one. It's giraffe pruned and quite flat. So there's enough sun that gets through that canopy uh, to give sunlight to the crop. And beans are fairly shade tolerant because the, the Mayan people who I featured in previous videos uh, grew uh, beans, frijoles, underneath and around maize. And so the beans were, as the maize grew quite tall, they was their 12 foot tall maize varieties. I will also add that maize, which is the staple crop of most of Africa, would not likely do well under the canopy, nor sorghum, which is one of the in original indigenous crops of Africa, unless the canopy was pruned and enough sunlight gets through. Maize needs a lot of sun and nitrogen, but the shade tolerant crops like beans, which are also a staple, are better candidates for this. I cover this very important topic in chapter 11, where I summarize my research in Tanzania from 2009 to 2016. So if you can grow these trees uh, along with a, a food crop, you have an additional resource there in the, the various uh, pods uh, of the tree, you have leaf fall, you have wood. And so that's the essence of agroforestry. Went to a professor uh, by the name of Pau, uh, and he's, uh, he, that was his, his area. And he gave me a spot in uh, his, in a, in a building uh, known as the back of Hoagland Hall with oh, graduate students, about half of them uh, from China. They had, uh, China had stopped allowing students to come to the U.S. to study. Uh, made pretty good friends with them. They, they were a, a fine bunch of people. My initial interest in agroforestry for these semi-arid food producing regions of, uh, was for a tree called, uh, named Acacia Tlis, which is the classic one that you see in some of the showing the the, air, the East African areas of, of uh, the wildlife. Um, it's a native tree there. It's very, the can uh, is, uh, I uh, believe it was well, very high uh, sunlight uh, limiting her. And I just, I wanted to do that, that research. This is Faderbia albida, formerly known as Acacia albida, that grows uh, in Southern Africa um, natively, it, um, it grows, oh, I, my experience from southern Tanzania through Malawi uh, down into Mozambique and then west in an arc in the wetter parts of these semi-arid areas of Africa. If there ever was a candidate for a holy grail tree, agroforestry tree, this Fadeherbia albida would be my candidate because uh, it's unique property is that it sheds its leaves at the beginning of the rains. The beginning of the rains is when crops are planted. And so shedding, it's, it's a legume, it's a uh, acacias, uh, it was, it was known as acacia, but we know that, you know, everybody knows that acacias are legumes. They fix nitrogen into their, in their roots. And, and so they can add, um, nitrogen into an agricultural system. And so, 
in these crop systems, such as uh, where they grow these in um, Malawi, they grow corn, maize, under these trees. They, and corn, uh, maize needs a lot of sun. And so these trees shed their leaves, um, fertilize the soil at the beginning of the rains, and then um, the crops can utilize those. And then during the dry season, when it's hot and dry, they, uh, they leaf out, they, they grow their leaves again. And so it's, um, this is something that I wanted, I, I wanted to research, but never was able to get to. Uh, I'm sure there are uh, researchers looking at it. If, if ever there was a, uh, an, a genetic engineering project in, you know, trees and agroforestry using, say, CRISPR or some of the more um, better scientifically developed um, ways of engineering uh, plants, then um, this would be, for me, a candidate. That mechanism for shedding leaves, um, for defoliating, uh, otherwise known as abscising, leaves at the at the beginning of, of the rains. It does it uh, the way uh, Federbia albida does it is by a response of getting what we call wet feet. In other words, the roots, um, and so it it grows in these areas that tend to be uh, waterlogged, have waterlogged soils um, during the rains uh, or uh, even flooding. And so I was very interested in that. That is something that, um, you know, would be very useful in, in so many agricultural systems. And so here in the U.S., I identified a, um, a tree system that um, I thought was, um, that could well, that needed investigation. That uh, that is the honey, honey locust tree, um, which is actually, um, it's a legume, but it doesn't fix nitrogen. But what I noticed was that these these uh, honey locust trees would shed their leaves very early in the fall, uh, earlier than any other trees, and uh, it was said to be something to do with a um, an insect, a midge, or something that that. Um, infest the leaves but that's what we want during that window of time at the beginning of the the winter rains in um, late October early November there's a window where the soils are wet uh, you know the the there's some rainfall and there the temperatures are warm enough for um, uh, for forages okay this would be for grazing land in um, on these hills that we have in California that that tend to be uh, easily eroded if especially if they're overgrazed and so i wanted to look at the potential for putting these uh um, honey locust trees on these you know in these areas so i wanted to, to look at the ones you know i could have uh, used the the honey locust trees on campus and done looked at the light regime and the um the timing of of the the leaf loss so that um at the beginning of that the winter when we when our forage grasses start to grow, which is in at the beginning of the rains in November, and our forage grasses grow all all winter, um, John Muir, the great uh, uh, wilderness man, mountain man, had said that uh, California has two seasons: summer and spring. Okay, our spring really starts in November, and so that's what um, I did. I, I made a proposal for doing that research. But it came at a time when there was really a lot of budget cuts um, all through the system from federal to state. And, and I just came up against this wall, both federal and state uh, budget cuts, as well as a sort of myopic bias towards funding uh, things having to do with uh, trees that needed to be native species. Uh, and I say myopic because all of the grasses that are in these photos, these rangeland grasses are Mediterranean grasses. They're introduced. All of our food crops are introduced. All of our tree, our, our orchard crops are uh, introduced from Asia and Europe. And so to uh, when they, when the committees turn down my, these are sustainable agriculture committees that, you know, they, they, they want to promote, uh, you know, indigenous, you know, uh, native species, but, it was simply myopic because, uh, you know, to say, well, this is an introduced honey locust is an 
an introduced species here in the West. And so my proposal was turned down. My interest in agroforestry continued. And I will um, talk later about my journalism, my, my travels from, well, all the way up Canada, all the way down the West Coast through Mexico and into Guatemala and then and Costa Rica. And I visited, in this case, in one case, a coffee growing uh, region in Oaxaca, Mexico, where forest, the coffee is grown under, a, virtually under, under, in a forest and was part of the uh, Smithsonian uh, bird friendly coffee program. And I'll describe that. But this forest grown coffee or, or bird friendly coffee was, uh, I think, probably the most natural form of, of agriculture that uh, I have seen agriculture that is um, profitable and productive for farmers uh, that I have ever seen. Many people thought that I should have gone or people, you know, who want to do agroecology should go to uh, University of California, Santa Cruz, which had an agroecology program, but it was a one, uh, you know, a one faculty program, Steve Gleesman, who wrote the textbook on agroecology and I had taught in that program in 1981. Uh, but you know, like I said, UC Davis had over 100 faculty in those two areas, agriculture and ecology, and another 100 experts, um, uh, staff, and uh, postgraduates, and, and labs that one could work in. But there was an issue between uh, public sector, sustainable agriculture, and organic farming, and and uh, versus the um, uh, big uh, private sector biotechnology and uh, what we called industrial agriculture. Although I think the uh, scientists at UC Davis um, were uh, open-minded in, in most areas, there was one big blind spot, and that was in genetic engineering of uh, crops and plants, they, um, the first generation of genetic engineering of food crops was so badly flawed uh, that uh, I wrote the two papers on it. Uh, but the university faculty just closed ranks. There was a, there was, you know, a, a huge propaganda campaign by the, the industry. It was, you know, the private sector, the big uh, M company, <laughs> Monsanto, was, um, had a huge campaign. And so faculty just, you know, closed ranks against it. I am convinced that in the history of science, they will review this, the younger generation will review this. Um, I mean, the evidence is just the scientific and peer reviewed evidence that there were huge flaws in the um, transgenic technology that they were using uh, to um, engineer these crops, these fruit crops, was just too huge, too big. And so that was one area that you really couldn't challenge back, um, you know, in the 1990s and into the, uh, I don't know how it is now, but well uh, into the 2000, uh, 2010, I want to make very clear that I'm not against all genetic engineering and biotechnology and that these the new forms have not kept up completely it's new forms of genetic engineering such as CRISPR and um, well in the papers that I wrote 10 years ago shown here um, I come I, you know I'll make that very clear that um, I'm pro genetic engineering for pharmaceuticals we are all going to be using um, pharmaceuticals that are that are um, based on the uh, transgenics and genetic engineering of, of well a lot of its bacteria and then other types of things but um, it just needs to be carefully vetted and researched um, and the at least half of that research funding has to come from public funding not from the private sector okay profit oriented because that was the foundation of the huge flaws 
in the original genetic engineering of, of plants is that the uh, federal funding had been pulled away. It's all, I make it clear in these papers, I explain it all, uh, that, um, you know, how this happened and that, and that scientists and their labs, they were dependent on the private funding uh, and there was a big uh, propaganda campaign, really, uh, and attacks on anyone who opposed and who gave the, the um, opposing view on, even if it was uh, from peer-reviewed science of, of um, the early forms of genetic engineering. So let me make that clear. The approach to science and education and independent thinking was very interesting to me uh, of the, the Chinese graduate students because they all would come up to me at one time or another and say, when they realized that I had come up with my own research uh, and gone to professor and gotten the okay, and they, that was a new concept to them. They come from a society, or they came at that time from a, you know, the communist Chinese society that just was completely top down and gave them uh, their education. And when they when they came, you know, they had applied and. And, and gotten into graduate programs and were given their, the research um, by the, the, the faculty at the universities in the U.S. And so they, um, it was really interesting when, they, when I explained to them that, uh, that I had um, come up with my own, uh, you know, my own research independently. I applied for funding uh, to do this research and then Fairly typically of, of me, I uh, flew to um, Washington, D.C. to try to get uh, funding to do this research in, um, in Kenya. And at that time, it just happened to be a time when they had cut funding. There was an act of Congress known as the Graham Rudman. And they, the funding was being pulled away, federal funding was being pulled away, and they were moving towards the market system. It was all part of the um, Reagan and uh, George H.W. Bush um, move towards the market system, which had big effects on, on research. And so um, when I went to Washington, D.C., and um, I stayed with these... Uh, uh, Bob and Nettie Grolick, who had been Peace Corps volunteers in uh, Malawi uh, with us under my dad. And, you know, dad knew that they lived in Washington and I called them up and, and, and went and stayed with them. At that time, I was still, um, the, the, the doctors had me on two medications. They had me on Valium. I might have, um, for a long time, they had me on Valium. That's how they treated the, the back spasms and the um, uh, and herniated discs. I think I had gotten off of it, but, but they still had me on what is known as Motrin, which is a strong, a very strong um, form of ibuprofen. And anybody with who knows about this long-term effects of taking... Um, ibuprofen or Motrin knows that uh, it um, it can really do damage to the stomach lining uh, and my stomach I had you know a damaged stomach I had uh, ulcer sort of a um, ulcerated stomach and I just needed um, a lot of time I remember staying for way too long with Bob and Nettie um, I think it was almost three weeks I couldn't do anything very fast back then they lived in, um, I can't remember which part of Washington, D.C., but there was this one incident where, um, and it was in February, uh, this was February of 1986, and it was, you know, the alternately raining and snowing and slushing, okay? There was just very, it was cold and wet, and I would take the bus into Washington, D.C., into downtown to, to go visit the various, op, you know, offices of the uh, U.S. Uh, Agency for International Development, USAID, uh, and other offices. I didn't, I really didn't know how to do these things very well. Um, I, you know, you have to connect 
with you know, various, you know, I should have gone to my congressperson or, um, but also at that time they were just holding on to their funds. They weren't, they weren't giving out anything. It was just not, not the right time. Um, so one day I took, I, I, it was getting dark and I got to the bus, uh, line, you know, I, I recognized the number and, um, but I wasn't at the, the, the bus stop that I had, um, you know, usually done or either that, or it was the, the, maybe only the first or second time I'd ridden it. So I asked the driver, is there a hospital at the end of this, at the end of the line? And he said, yeah. And so I got on and this, the bus started, uh, you know, off and I noticed the, the, the passenger started to change from having, you know, um, maybe, you know, half white, half black to two thirds, uh, to one third white, two thirds black, to three quarters, to four fifths, to my being the only white person on this bus. And <laughs> it was so, I, I just enjoyed it because, you know, I've lived in Africa and I, and I, I just, I couldn't figure out what um, was going on. And because this was not the ride that I was expecting, I was expecting to go into this place that, you know, Washington DC has this huge, uh, city of uh, that's mostly black and then other parts that are mixed or mostly white and so I went and asked the uh, the bus driver I said um you know there's there's uh I guess I had asked one of the the um people waiting for the bus if there was if there was a hospital at the end and they said yes and I asked and then I said asked the black bus driver now there's a hospital at the end of this this line right and he said there's a sunny there's a hospital at the end of at either end of this line, and you are going to the wrong one. He knew, <laughs> and he said, "Just hold on, sit, sit down, back, back me. I will get you back." And and so I sat, and you know, it was. I remember this one big, you know, huge black guy getting on, and he had the gold necklace and the gold watch, and he was just, he was just greeting, and uh, you know, all of the. Uh, Hey, how are you doing, darling? You know, um, <laughs> the women. And it was just, it was really a trip. People were kind of staring at me like, what what was I doing on this bus? So I waited the, you know, I, it was an hour out to that, that the other end, you know, the hospital, the, the wrong end, and then another two hours to get to the hospital at the, that I wanted to get to. And, and so that was one of my experiences in Washington, D.C. I failed to get any leads on, on my trip to Washington, D.C. And so back in Davis, uh, I had, oh, at least a year uh, for the next, um, to prepare for the next deadlines for funding proposals. And so I began to focus on other things. One of the things that I it was a, um, we, uh, UC Davis has a program known as Outdoor Adventures, uh, which, uh, in which student, well, actually students and then anybody from the community um, can sign up to take these trips. And so I took a couple of trips with um, one of the, uh, a couple of the senior uh, guides on those trips and then applied to be a guide and was hired to do various backpacking trips to um, the Sierra, Nevada mountains uh, in summer, and then in spring trips to longer trips to um, Death Valley and to Grand Canyon. So over the next several years, I took these groups of um, sometimes all students um, or students plus one or two. Uh, to people from outside the uh, community to these places and there were uh, it was it was fun because I you know had done these things all of my life uh, backpacking and and so I had the skills to to show them and teach them and and um, there were always some kinds of uh, personalities and and various incidents that um, were memorable. One was when we went to Death Valley uh, in, it was 
um, it was the end of March. We take these. That's when the the um, uh, the valley is you know is, is desert ecosystem and and but it has these mountains that tower over it, the Sierras. Um, and so we I, I uh, took the group up uh, one of the uh, the peaks, uh, Telescope Peak, which is nearly ten thousand feet, I think, and looks straight down into Death Valley, um, where to where it's uh, 300 feet below sea level. And so I took this group up and there was a plateau about one or 2,000 feet below the, uh, the top of Telescope Peak that I had everybody, you know, we hiked up in the morning and pitched our tents in the afternoon. And I had, uh, there were always just a few foreign students. And, and so um, it was windy and cold um, Sierra Nevada at uh, seven or eight, you know, seven thousand feet is um, is cold in March, and my tent was big enough to hold three people. So I had a, a Japanese um, student, a student from Japan, and then another uh, woman who uh, I knew. We we were all in my tent and could uh, it was it was big enough to sleep three, and so the. Um, we had had two meetings before the trip to, you know, so I could tell people what to bring and what kind of equipment they needed. And, and so I had said, okay, each person needs to bring one meal. And we went over what, you know, what was good backpacking food. And, and so the Japanese student, Kenji, um, you know, it was his turn to provide the meal. Uh, so we got into the, you know, the wind was, was blowing and it was cold and we got in there and I had the little stove I could cook inside the, the tent. It was too windy. To, normally I would have cooked, you know, fired up the Svea, little Svea stove outside, but inside the tent, I could do it safely enough. And so I said, Kenji, it's your turn. What did you bring? And so he brings out this little packet uh, of um, stew, uh, beef stew flavoring. And it had it, this photo, it had a picture of beef stew, you know, the beef and the... Oh, my cat and dog are wrestling again. Um, this picture of beef stew, and and he he brought it out, and it was like I guess he thought that it would expand into this meal. <laughs> Tina and I looked at it, and and I man, I said, Kenji, this this is not um, you know we we can't this is not enough food for us. So I had to dive into my pack and get out the uh, emergency supplies, you know, I had a couple of packets of, of ramen and got them out and, you know, and, and then probably, I think I had some other various things from, from various backpacking trips in there and put together a dinner and we ate and it came out all right, but that was funny. But Kenji, the other thing was he had this, now this was 19, it was 1987, I think. And, and he had this watch that I would, you know, he, he would, I see him staring at it and I would hear this sound, you know, like a bam, you know, like a, it was a baseball game that was on this Japanese watch that he had. And I would hear this little voice coming out of the watch saying, Shinji Lalanai. And, <laughs> and he would play that for, you know, an hour and we were, while well, we were, um, you know, in the tent and, and I said, Kenji, what, what's that? What is that? And he said, oh, baseball. And I said, well, what does it mean, Shinji Lalanai? He said, that's incredible. When home run. <laughs> and so he had this this little voice coming out of the, this this watch, you know, when he scored a homer. Uh, that's incredible. Anyway, that was Kenji. And this was, of course, before any, um, there were any cell phones or any, I, I suppose there were little games, you you know, handheld game things, but this was on a on a watch, kind of a thick, big watch. There were other characters on these trips. On one, uh, on another trip to Death Valley, we we went to what is known as Scotty's Castle, and it's kind of a um, uh, it's a place that has a, a swimming pool. It's you know because Death Valley is a national park, so it's run by the National Park Service, um, and. We went in and we, we, you know, paid the money to go take a swim and take showers and stuff. And, and, and we took, you know, several hours to do a couple of hours to do that. 
got out to the car and the sheriff drives up and he he says who you know who's the leader who, who's what's going who's the uh leader of this group and he takes me aside he said you know one of your group is a uh, is a thief i said what these are uc davis students um i don't understand he said how but apparently um one of the one of these students was some kind of klepto type and had i guess pilfered people's belongings in the locker room and i i just couldn't i didn't realize that until after and the, and the sheriff of course he couldn't do any you know he, he I guess he didn't have any evidence uh, and i said well you know these are uc davis students so, you know they're not and so he said just watch it okay just be careful. You've got someone here who's who's a thief. And I never did know because some people, you know, people hide these things. And so they, these are some of the things I learned in taking these groups. There was another group that I took up to um, an area of Yosemite known as the Minarets, uh, where these these peaks, uh, Banner and Ritter, are well known. They're they're really you know, sharp, very uh, picturesque peaks um, that are too, they're too steep to take up, you know, a group of students up, but we went and camped near them. And, and um, on that trip, we, uh, that was in mid-September. And back then, um, we didn't have as good of uh, weather forecasting, but I did carry a, um, a, what is known as a weather radio. It was a little, um, I think it was shortwave, that was only it had a, a little dial that you could turn to about three or three different um, frequencies and you'd get this national weather service uh, 24 hours a day announcement that was uh, of, of what the weather was doing because at that time of year in the sierra you, that was something that was important it was just a little little uh, transistor the size of the my palm of my hand with a aerial i could pull out and and so I, you know, so there's a storm coming in and we were you know, already three or four days in and they didn't have, you know, reports that were beyond four days. So I didn't, I couldn't know that, you know, at the beginning of the trip, but I had everybody prepared for, um, you know, any, any kind of, you know, inclement weather. And so this uh, snowstorm blew in. And so I had everybody, um, I got them into their tents and, we had, I had everybody carrying extra uh, stove, stove fuel and some of them, you know, they, they were ready to, get, you know, to be scared, to, to get really get scared. They, some, there was uh, an Italian guy and his girlfriend from Somalia, actually, uh, and um, they had never been and they were, they were ready to panic. And I just said, everybody, you know, get in your tents and, um, you know, you can cook outside your tent, just fire up your stoves. It, was, it wasn't a windy blizzard, it was snowing. And so I got everybody in their tents and we had, we melted, you know, we, we were near a water body and got everybody through the 24 hour, uh, you know, winter like storm, which can happen in mid September. And um, I guess it must've been the third week of September. And so um, got people through that and, um, just one of the things that uh, you know you have to be prepared for but also on that trip was a a guy who turns out that uh, turned out to be um, schizophrenic and he began to behave really oddly um, fortunately it was towards the end as I recall of the of the trip and we all um, perhaps he had not brought his medication um, but it was uh, towards the end of the trip and we he was behaving really erratically and saying oh I need to go home we need to go home we need to go now and, you know, so I finally you know we got through that another person who was on one of the trips was uh, a, a a judge from Sacramento who um, had signed up as one of the outside people and we got to this place that was on that trip and um uh that you know had the snowstorm and 
we'd gotten to this lake near Banner and Ritter Peaks, and it had a boulder field uh, that we, you know, 100 meters uh, along the edge of the lake. You know, build boulders right down, you know, going big boulders going right down into the lake. And we got to the boulder field, and and she stopped and she said, um, "I have a, I have a phobia of boulders." <laughs> And so, you know, I, I stopped and, you know, we didn't, we, I wanted to get to the other side so that we could camp on this other side. And, and so I had to kind of change the, uh, the, um, the, the, the trip and, and not cross the boulder field. Uh, but that's the kind of thing that, that happens. And so I think it was, it was also, it was the trip in which, uh, we had the, uh, the the hidden thief that we got back and i had told people to uh oh park your cars in <clears throat> the safeway parking lot because it's only you know it's a it's a 10 minute walk from where we were meeting and getting into the university van to to you know drive up to um and it was a you know it was a 10 day trip and when we got back all of their cars had been towed <laughs> and so they you know, uh, some of them went to Outdoor Adventures and made a formal complaint and Outdoor Adventures had to pay them, you know, for the, and so that year I got, when, when they had, um, at the end of the academic year, they had the Outdoor Adventures guides, um, you know, annual sort of annual party, potluck, barbecue. I got the Broken Ski Award, which was, uh, this broken ski about one foot the binding with the rest of the ski broken off because someone had taken a <clears throat> cross-country ski group up and had on the way back had not fastened down the skis and when they got onto the highway all the skis blew off and were run over by you know the huge trucks and cars <laughs> and so they he had that they had this broken ski with you know with it in emblazoned, you know, with writing Baruch and Ski Award. So we got that, that award that year. On all of the trips to the east side of the Sierra, either backpacking or to Death Valley or to the Grand Canyon, uh, we, um, I would always take that uh, Highway 395 down the east side, which is very, is beautiful and scenic. And I always would go to a hot spring. There are lots of hot springs, lots of geological activity on that east side, all the way between the east side and around Death Valley, and then on the way to Grand Canyon. And so I've always took the students to um, these hot springs, and, you know, I'd, I'd tell them, look, you know, this is a um, clothing optional place. There might be other people, um, and, you know, you can uh, do as you like, you know, wear a bathing suit or, you know, go in the skinny and I would kind of go with whatever the you know majority of them did um, and so um, these hot springs were always there. some of them were um, you know actually a hot spring that was at the bottom of a creek or a river others were dug out uh, that uh, as I explained before they would dig them out so that the water temperature would just stay at about 105 degrees a nice hot uh, bath temperature and so we would do these um actually there were there were trips to um big sur as well because there was a hot spring and and big sur that we uh that i took uh, students to and so these were always um fun and sort of eye-opening for the students some of them they they would just most of them just take off all their clothes and go in and and um so it was it was uh uh, that was that was fun the other thing we used to do on the grand canyon trips was to go to uh to Las Vegas and the I would uh, you know I tell them, okay we're gonna on the way back uh, this was after hiking you know getting up five in the morning hiking for four hours up from the uh, uh, the, the river to the Colorado River uh, to the rim and then you know packing up and, and driving and so uh, I'd say, okay, we're gonna we'll spend a night in Las Vegas. We'll get a room. We we'll, we we all agreed to split. This was you know an agreement at the beginning of the trip. We'll split for a room. There were eight people, eight of us, and uh, we can eat there because the casinos um, were and possibly still are good places to 
Uh, their, their food was good and very reasonably priced because they, would, they wanted to get people there to, you know, to gamble. And so we, um, when we got the room and then went down and had a nice big dinner after camping, you know, and, and backpacking for eight days and um, enjoyed that. And then I would, we would go into the, to the, you know, the casino part of these places and and i would you know we'd walk around a little bit i'd say this is blackjack and some of them had already you know they were from families that had already done this but i'd say okay off you go go in pairs and then we'll meet back in the room and so everybody you know nobody went for very long because we were all exhausted and up in the room we there was a you know, one double bed that was the the room that was the cheapest and then everybody else and then and then people took their sleeping bags and pads to sleep on the floor so the the, the queen size or king size bed was could sleep three people and it was a pretty choice thing so we i said okay let's draw straws and can't remember exactly how we did it but two women and a guy would sleep in the um in the big you know king size bed and so we drew straws and I was the, the guy who got the straw. I know you're you're probably chuckling, yeah, right. <laughs> but I got the, the straw to sleep in the bed with the, the uh, with two of the the uh, the women. Now this was all. There were eight people in this room. This was all in the up and up. Um, so uh, no sneering. And um, so we all you know went to sleep. I was on on the edge. Um, the edge of the bed and 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 on the on the outside part um fortunately towards the bathroom because i had a massive <laughs> i can only describe as a massive wet dream and because they had you know the the most beautiful you know girl in the in the on the trip was sleeping right next to me in the middle and you know it was it, we were you know with eight people in the room there wasn't going to be any hanky panky so anyway i woke up and i was a big mess in my <laughs> I, you know, at that time, uh, you know, I, I, my pajamas were, were uh, bottoms were scrub, were hospital scrubs. And, um, and so I woke up and with this big mess and I, and I, and I just laid there real still. I was like, okay, all right. What do, this is, this is a big mess. It's smelly. It smells like jism. And, but everybody was sound asleep again. Everybody was exhausted, you know, and they were sleeping in, indoors and there was a nice soft carpet and then their their pads you know so people were sound asleep um i'm pretty darn sure and so i carefully got up and, and you know tiptoed to my pack and got my shorts out and and then went into the bathroom and changed into my shorts and I washed my the um the upper part of the, the scrubs and squeezed it out and dried it as much as i could with a towel and scrunched it up and then went back to my pack and stuffed it way down in there and then went back to bed and then the next morning woke up and I was looking around like and I swear to this day you know I don't think anybody was aware of it and um it was kind of like dodged a, a, a bullet that they would have laughed at um anyway it, two of them are still two of these uh, you know including the the woman in the middle <laughs> are you know still friends or we're not in contact but um they can laugh about this because one of them uh the one of the guys who's who's a friend uh is still we're in touch on facebook so anyway that was um <laughs> i still laugh at that i you know i was careful on these trips all of these trips to take a professional approach to being the guide i mean i had experience teaching um at UC Santa Cruz and and I knew you know that guiding is important to just um, really even even when there were very attractive you know young women on these trips to to just take a professional um, and uh, uh, approach but that didn't there were still times when one of them would you know come to my tent in the night and knock and sort of say oh, can I come in and that was always nice uh, when that happened but other than that it was um, I, I was careful to keep it uh, professional. Another place that I always stopped at with um, these student groups on the way to Death Valley and, on, and uh, to the Grand Canyon, we would drive down Highway 395 on the east side of the Sierra, um, that beautiful drive, and um, we'd stop at the Manzanar uh, internment camp where 
uh, during World War II in 1942 when we had uh, gone to war against Imperial Japan, um, the uh, uh, federal government had instituted the um, these camp internment camps for Japanese Americans. It was, you know, it was a it was a racist policy. Uh, these uh, Japanese Americans were, um, you know, just uh, loyal Americans, uh, all of them, and yet they they were relocated into these camps. And so I. Back in 1987, 88, 89, 90, when I was doing these trips, um, the the um, it was not as well known. This I mean, because it's it's become they've they've really publicized this whole thing quite well now uh, in the 2000s. But uh, back then, most of the students really didn't know about this part of our history, and so we would stop there, and I would take them. Around they had some of the buildings were still there. The uh, actually they were just stone slabs, but and there was a monument. But then there was a um, a, a guard tower and a uh, the um, entrance that obviously the Japanese had built because the roof had this slight upturn at the corners. It was uh, so um, well oriental because it was both Chinese and Japanese. Something I don't know why. I guess it was to um, Get this <laughs> if any spirits landed there they would slide up and away um, but it, it reminds me of part of the story of my of my California culture that uh, I'm proud of my grandmother Gladys Vernon Lauder uh, was uh, my dad's mom was uh, she was religious she was one of the uh, she was a, a, a loyal a tender of the Baptist, the local Baptist church in Alameda, California, near, you know, it's, it's, um, Oakland, Alameda, near San Francisco. And she, uh, when this, she was the, she was the pianist who I um, talked about in Ancestors chapter, um, musician and, and piano teacher. And she had many, uh, she had a number of Japanese students and former, current, uh, and uh, in the community. And so she went to the church, this Baptist church that she had raised my dad going to, and, and they, they had, the church had a, this fire and brimstone uh, Baptist preacher who had you know, alienated my dad from any <laughs> organized religion for the rest of my dad's life. Uh, you know, he joined the Unitarian Church, which is not a religion, and I was raised in that. But he, this this preacher was, um, you know, uh, had made a big difference in in our lives. Anyway, um, he uh, Grandma was the the organ player in the church and had been for years. She went to this uh, minister, and she told him on no uncertain terms that they were going to use the basement of the church to store the pianos of these Japanese families, Japanese American families who were being relocated to the camps up at Goose Lake, up at Manzanar, uh, in, there, there were camps in Arizona and uh, in uh, Utah. And um, there was, there's an author, um, a Japanese American author by the name of Mas, Matsumoto, who uh, has written a number of books about his farming. Uh, he's an early, he was one of the pioneers in California of sustainable agriculture. And Moss remembers this and he wrote about it. Uh, and and um, that uh, this, uh, this woman, Mrs. Lauder, had stored the pianos of these families until after the war and after they were they were uh, released and could come back as many of these families lost their houses they lost all their property they lost their farms they were farmers they were tended to be uh, market garden farmers uh, an old California uh, tradition of the uh, of the Japanese Americans so that was that's one of the stories then the other also involving uh, Gladys Vernon Lauder my grandmother was um, the story of, of her um, she had hired uh, a, by the name of Mary, Mary Yee, 
I tell the story of Mary Yi in the Ancestry chapter. Mary was Japanese American born and had married a Chinese man apparently in order to take on a Chinese name and avoid being sent to internment camps. And in that chapter, uh, I tell the story of how Grandma went to the internment camp to bond Mary out. And Mary was so thankful that she vowed to work for Grandma for the rest of her life without a single penny of pay. And so I tell that story. So this is part of my California heritage that um, I'm, I'm proud of. I failed to get funding for my research. I was, we were, we were in, going into a time of um, financial difficulties. California was cutting its budget. The federal government was cutting its budget with this Graham Rudman uh, Act. And so I put my research on the back burner and started a project that I'd been interested in for a long time, and that is an exploration of Western consciousness. And I, did, I was able to do this via the UC Davis, University of California Davis, uh, experimental college. They had started that back in about 1971 oh, or 72 and I'd been teaching uh, a course on called the basics of low-budget travel. I had been teaching for years, it's 1973, every time I was in Davis. And so I, I came up with this course to explore Western consciousness in a way with um, th that it was more of an exploratory course. It was sort of shared and I would um, provide the framework, I guess. It included things like the, um, the, the original, you know, the, the way people thought, the, this, these various um, theories. Uh, I had quite a few books on this and also included the, what we call the new physics, uh, quantum physics and exploration using some of the, the, the great books that have been written to sort of bring that to our um, sort of various authors have taken all that mathematics and physics and um, done a pretty good job of making sense of it for us. I used a, a scenario, I guess, uh, sort of um, an analogy to summarize the course with, um, and so this this analogy imagines a river and beings um, living in the river, uh, then beginning to build the, a a sort of a, a raft, I guess, floating on the um, to the point where it pretty much covers all of the water, all of the river and we build, we keep building up and up, sort of a Tower of Babel, so to speak. This is what I imagine science to be, is building up to, to the sky and into space where I imagine Einstein, okay, up in the very top up there, then gives us, comes back and tells us that, that space and space is curved. It curves downward. And so, I sort of leave it there with that, with the quantum physics, uh, various physicists bringing back these these quite bizarre and wild things that, that are mathematically shown, the multiple dimensions, the nine or ten dimensions. Uh, then down at the base, we have Fr Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud opens a trapdoor and sees water. The river underneath. Well, I imagine it as Freud seeing water. And then his student Jung, uh, they both go into the water. That's, of course, the subconscious mind. And Jung explores more and, and comes back and says, look, the, the, the water is flowing. It flows. It connects us all. It's consciousness. And then below that, even at the bottom, I, I imagine you know, we talked about Stanislav Grof and Charles Tart's book, Altered States of Consciousness. Jung and 
uh, Groff and those people find another trap door at the bottom of this river. And in looking through it, they see the stars and they see then Einstein reaching out. And so I imagine the sort of uh, the Sistine Chapel of the two of the two arms, you know, the two fingers touching. But that is is how I, I um, sort of visualize what what we're doing, what we were doing in that this this course. That it was uh, called the the uh, uh, exploring the paradigm shift. That was the the name of of the course. I explored how Western consciousness, Western culture, has lost much of the um, of the, I guess, embracing or the being in touch with that um, altered state. And so the other word that I like to use is resonance. That this, the, we, we lost touch with the resonance mode of, uh, and so in the, in the new physics, the quantum physics, we have the particle wave duality and where these uh, atomic entities, these these uh, atomic particles have also have a wave function, and so the particle, uh, the particle part of it is is more dualistic. We we can measure it, we can see it. We uh, the wave part was much more difficult, and has been. And that is, in this analogy, the resonance mode. How do we get back in touch with the resonance mode? And this was so we we just explored various ways that this has been done with the tradition of sh the shamanic tradition, the tradition of trance. And I, so I, I realized that I'd um, been part of a culture. I had, in Africa, the Africans, I realized, had harnessed this resonance mode uh, much more than um, we have in Western culture. And so the, the Africans, of course, they are so much about um, resonating together. I have to let this helicopter pass. It's 6 a.m. I'm out in my sanctuary. So it is this resonance mode that a number of parts of our Western society have been trying to get in touch with. Okay, so Carl Jung and his subsequent um, followers Okay, the Jungians uh, who I talked about in the previous chapter, the um, the '60s, the the drug culture of the '60s, the entire this, that was a discerning a, a the sensing of a of a need to resonate beyond one's individual self, and. So then there's the interest in, in trance and altered states. My sense is that resonance that we still, we still need to um, embrace this other part of ourselves other than the, the rational mind that gives us science. We need to, to embrace that. And my sense is that it's going to be that the resonance is going to be with each other. Okay, as, a, as, a, as a scientist of, who I've, I've studied and taught uh, and participated in graduate school in evolution, in human evolution, the evolution of, of human behavior, of human mind. And I, I sense that this will be what the resonance will be is with each other, whether the quantum physics will be part of our resonance mind. I, I'm not sure. There are a number of books written about this. Um, we know from physics, from quantum physics, that there are at least nine dimensions, um, four of which we live in, and whether individuals can resonate with some of those other uh, dimensions, that's I don't know. Um, I'm kind of doubtful, but um, nevertheless, this will be 
Um, I think we need to find the people who have the kind of mind that is um, that can embrace this and need to find those people and have them help us um, to um, forge a way for human society, for human culture to live so that a majority of us live well in the future. So that was the main part of the main thing about um, the Paradigm Shift course. We also looked at past societies and the possibilities on the books written about how women were more um, powerful and possibly uh, were uh, leaders in this mode of, of resonance. In the spring of 1987, I found out about the uh, U.S. Forest Service uh, fire crew um, hiring for that summer. And so I signed up to take the, um, the initial uh, classroom training. And that was up in Chico, which is where the, um, our uh, eventual Forest Service uh, fire crew um, was out of the, was the headquarters of the Mendocino National Forest. And, and so I ignored the warnings that um, you got to get there on time. You got to be there before 830 or else. And so I, I was late. It's a two hour drive to Chico. I was late and I was 10 minutes late. And I went up to the doors and it was locked. And they said, no, nope, sorry. That was my introduction to Chuck Sheely. He was the former smoke jumper uh, boss of the fire crews uh, who was a legend and who we all came to like very much. I had to turn around, get in my car, drive home, sign up for another classroom type thing. It's just a one day thing. So having passed the eighth grade level written test, I signed up for the hands-on training, which uh, uh, would be for a weekend overnight uh, in Mendocino National Forest. And so I showed up at four in the morning for the, uh, to get on the buses. There were two of them, because I think there must have been 60 or 70 people signed up. They needed crews fire crews so got on the bus and then they were all saying okay we're almost ready to go where's Sunil hey go call Sunil he slipped through his two alarms and um, that was my introduction to Sunil Ramalingam now a judge in Idaho but back then I was like who who's this guy who's this Sunil guy and so you know five minutes later this kid this skinny kid obviously East Indian with a, a single eyebrow all the way across the lower part of his forehead by his own admission a monobrow and um, he gets on the bus and everybody's yeah Sunil you made it and he's got this baritone laugh that uh, he, and he was high-fiving everybody. Well, that, yeah, that was my introduction to Sunil. I can't resist inserting another Sunil story here. In the background, you'll see this big field that, you know, the, we always, they always put fire camps in these safety zones that couldn't be burned. Uh, but in the background here, you see the dry stubble and this, uh, a, a large uh, piece of burning ash, very large, probably a foot wide, you know, the fires get real hot and landed in the middle of this field in the background. And there were at least 20 fire engines uh, parked just to the right of us in this photo. And Sunil, barefoot, grabs a shovel and yells, fire and starts running <laughs> running out to where this little this little fire of stubble 
had had grown to about 10 feet in diameter and maybe the stubble was a little larger it was another it might have been another fire where the stubble was you know six to eight inches high and completely dry and the fire crews in the engines these were city these were urban firefighters that were called in there were these were red fire engines and they would get called in to the big fires they always had um an engine one engine on call and these guys <laughs> were just looking at each other and laughing at this barefoot kid running out with his shovel to put out this fire because all they had to do was, you know, one guy, they looked at each other, okay, who wants to go out and squirt, you know, the, the fire with the fire hose? And so one of the engines, you know, just slowly drove out. Sunil backed up and watched while this uh, fire engine just spent 10 seconds, uh, you know, squirting this huge, you know, thing of water from the fire engine onto this little fire. <laughs> Uh, Sunil, I can't forget that one. I had to interject it here in 2024 in my last revision of these uh, videos. And the rest um, is, uh, is history. He, uh, Sunil became kind of a social center for the fire crews, uh, you know, in camp, whether or out on the line. He was always good uh, to rise up for challenge. Uh, a challenge and was an irrepressible jokester which um, I have uh, corresponded with him recently and asked him uh, Sunil how do you keep that irrepressible humor out of your courtroom especially the kind that has to do with um, sort of off-color sexual oriented jokes and he, he dashed back, it ain't easy. <laughs> anyway, that's the nail. So we got through the training. It went all day and then all night um, because they wanted to make sure we could go for, and it, you know, and then the next morning. And a few people, there, there was a group, there was a, a group of half a dozen who didn't make it and were sitting by the buses um, when we got back to them on, on Sunday morning. Um, but it was uh, pretty pretty standard stuff just out there, uh, making sure we didn't have a phobia about fire. They did have some fires. They had a area that they could do some control burns uh, that were perfectly safe in the spring. And so, so we uh, we all a bunch of us qualified and waited for. We got pagers. Uh, had a couple of parties and waited for our first fire call. One of the distinct, distinctive things that the Davis fire crew came, became well known for was for the morning poll, uh, as in morning survey, but the morning poll you will um, understand is a double entendre. One morning, and it was our first, it was only our second fire, it was our first big fire. Um, the uh i think it was called the quaking fire and we were put up to sleep in these uh forest service uh empty houses and so we were sleeping on you know all 20 of us in in this this room with our uh forest service uh issue disposable sleeping bags that that are just these white things with with uh insulation that uh, actually I used for years. I'd take mine home and use them to sleep on the roof for <laughs> for years. They were good. They were they were fine, and um, had a number of them. And so, you know, we were all woken up at four thirty in the morning. I think it was, and the the uh, head for service, you know, the incident commander, I guess they call him, came in. You know, turns on the light and says, everybody up now, let's get going, got to get going. And so we were all rolling over and starting to sit up and Sunil, um, he kind of sits up and we're all still in our sleep bag and looks down at himself towards his private parts. And he goes, um, 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 and the, by this time the guy had closed, you know, closed the door and gone away and goes, um, um right now sir right exactly this instant 
<laughs> and we all looked at him and he's looking down at himself and well that we laughed about that and in subsequent days we talked about walk, walk you know waking up with a woody okay so there were that's what they called it you know hard on and they um we had two categories we had the bus woody which when you fall asleep on the bus um and you wake up and, and it's just the jolting and the jostling especially on the dirt roads going to these fires um that would happen and then there was the morning in the morning and so they would they got talking about it and okay how many woke up this morning morning poll and thumbs up meant you you woke up with an erection and um thumbs down was you didn't and so every morning we did that we taught the other crews to do that and pretty soon all of these crews were i mean even on other fires you know a year later we would you know morning pull or just put your thumbs up and these like i remember a hot shot crew the, these were the sort of elite who would do the initial attack on these fires they would get the helicopter rides up to you know they were the first ones in and um you know they would it was thumbs up or thumbs down and it's interesting it was um always about 15 to 20 percent of the guys and i found that it was also about 15 or 20 percent of the time that i would wake up in such a condition so uh anyway that um was the tradition of the morning pole i'll have to ask if they have kept that tradition um i think that is an important one um, but of course it was, uh, it was all started by Sunil. kids on fire crew and I call them kids because I was 10 what 12 to 15 years older than than them <laughs> there was a lot of them were so smart they could recite and sing the lyrics to these songs like highway to heaven by Aunt Robert Plant um, and so we had this 45 minute bus ride to our second fire uh, from where we were staying the uh, the quaking fire in 1987 and they played every morning they would play dire straits money for nothing and they could sing the the, the lyrics and then occasionally sunil would or or kurt anthony we called him anthony back then um would uh you know recite a line from uh monty python a monty python movie and they would kind of go back and forth and then somebody in the some guy in the back you know, three rows back would, would continue it. And they'd go on for minutes that way, uh, verbatim imitating the Monty Python characters or the um, characters of, uh, what was his name, O'Neill, I think, uh, in um, the movie Airplane. And um, it, was, it, was really, it was really funny. 
and then waiting in these long chow lines uh, at these fire camps when the fire's really big there'd be 2,000 firefighters and, and they'd have contractors you know doing a really great job of giving us really good food but we'd have to often wait you know in long lines and um, Sunil would occasionally do something like imitate Mick Jagger or Madonna and have everybody just rolling in the dirt and you know, with laughter it was uh, quite the show. I wish we had a video of that. At the time that I signed up in 1987, uh, the leader of the Davis Fire Crews was a woman by the name of Nadine Cronkite, and um, we ended up uh, we ended up having four crews, three or four uh, fire crews um, each summer for the next three years that I worked, um, and every 20 person crew we had two to two to four women and we were we were really careful to um make those uh we were all almost all students at uc davis probably 15 out of of the 20. um i don't remember any other any graduate students they were all undergraduates i was a graduate student 35 years old and it was an older graduate student so i was 10 to 15 years older than than the rest of the uh, the crews, um, but we we really made an effort to uh, make the women feel comfortable and um, and so in the second year in 1988, I was on a crew that got uh, called up to Oregon. The way these crews happen is that um, if you're on a fire in the north of California and they have fires in you know. Uh, in this case in Oregon, they call the crews and we happened to be in the north, so we went up to Oregon. And in the same way, we uh, after this incident I'm gonna talk about, we got called, um, the Yellowstone fires were starting and all of the crews in Montana, uh, or was it Wyoming, got uh, those two states anyway, got called to the Yellowstone fires. And so we got called to the outlying fires that were breaking out um, that were not the actual Yellowstone fire. And so we had this nice long, long trip, bus, bus time we called it, because we got paid for riding the bus. So we, um, we were up in Oregon and we had the usual three or four women. And this one woman was particularly um, pretty attractive. And um, she, uh, you know, with, with um, prominent breasts, I'll say, and she had her eyes on all the guys, especially the guys. I, at that time, was a squad leader, and our crew leader was Alan. And um, we, you know, we, we sort of kept things the way we'd always done, just not getting involved with any, you know, sexually involved with any women. So this woman, um, I was, she invited me to go play cards with um, what they called the, um, the, the Forest Service Liaison. Every, um, the, li the Forest Service Trainee Liaison. So every, so it was the Forest Service Liaison and his trainee. And they happened to be related. And um, this one was real, I don't think he, he was ever hired. He was, you know, a problem. But they, we, we, she invited me to go play cards with them in their room so I played cards and then I said okay I'm going I'm going to you know good night I'm going to bed and I just didn't think anything the next day everybody was joking that she had slept with and had a wild night with these two guys and um she you know kept uh it it got to a point where she, where you know Alan had to do something so she transferred he transferred her to another crew because it was becoming um, the, these these two uh, Forest Service guys uh, were obviously distracted by her, and so they trans. He made a transfer for to to a Chico crew, and the Chico crews were made up of more the the guys who were more sort of macho and you know whatever. We we there was a distinct difference between Chico and Davis. Davis, you know being the difference i think between at that time the universities there were more serious students were at davis and so this woman starts um sleeping with the uh 
with the force was it the the crew leader of the um of that chico crew and the force service liaison for that crew he didn't he he said this is against the rules and and um that crew leader he was sleeping with her every night and it, the crew divided in half and came to fisticuffs or almost it i can't remember exactly what happened but they these two you know one half was behind the fire crew leader who who was keeping them on uh because he was married and didn't want to go home he wanted to keep the uh this little uh tryst going and the the uh the liaison the force service liaison guy uh you know wanted you know to follow the rules and just demobilize um and so they actually came to blows as i recall and that you know that just you know this this was one crew okay and and that just never would have happened in the davis fire crews we we really um we developed a really good reputation and we heard this back from uh other crews that uh we um and that was one of the the real watershed events that defined us um that we transferred this woman instead of sending her home or punishing her in some way we sent her and so um that we we the word got back we got around that davis fire crews is, is a you know they're a class act they do they don't complain they do their work um well human evolution and its psychology and biology have always been a uh, great interest to me and so i learned things on these Thing on fire crew one is that when we went through the the um, burned areas there every hundred yards or so there would be a, a, a stump of a tree burning and some of the nights got really cold especially in Wyoming and Montana and up in Washington State and Oregon and in the high altitudes of California and so you could sit you know by these fires and and then I think I have a photo of me heating up one of my ham sandwiches with a sho you know, on my shovel. Um, but it's really, it was really easy to see how fire was, you know, I mean, they talk about the invention of fire, but it, it was just a no-brainer. I mean, that these the forest fires would come through and then you'd have these burning logs and stumps and people obviously, and during cold weather would, would sit around them. And, and then there was a time I found the rattlesnake on the uh, uh, well, we were in Nevada in the hills on a fire and and perfectly cooked and I took s several bites out of it and um, kind of made a name for myself doing that. Um, but it was you know I knew that rattlesnake was good to eat. Um, we did breathe a lot of smoke, wood smoke. Um, but a couple things I did, um, I, I put together my experience traveling in the tropics and backpacking to really uh, develop the skills of staying hydrated and so when I became a squad leader and then a crew leader I you know they they actually I heard a couple people say Don hydrate lotter <laughs> like, I say come on you guys stay you, you got to stay hydrated because there were some of the longer fires that were you know go for we'd be away for a week um, everybody would catch a really bad cold and be pretty miserable but often I was the only one who didn't catch a cold because I was really working at staying hydrated and I, that's what I attribute it to. It was during hot you know, weather and a lot of work. But also I carried to these fires large amounts of uh, fresh fruit, especially grapes. And in the, um, the fire camps where we were fed by these um, contractors, uh, they also had fruit, and I would grab huge amounts of them, take them back to my, to uh, where, you know, we were sleeping, to our camp, and and um, and I just ate a lot of fruit. I would carry it uh, in my little, the little uh, backpack thing that we all wore, and um, I also think that that, um, because I knew that you know breathing um, smoke was, you know that that was well, smoke's carcinogenic, but. I also think, you know, we, we evolved 
in uh, caves and huts and various places breathing a lot of uh, wood smoke. And, you know, our systems, I think, are adapted to a certain extent to breathing um, wood smoke and needs. We, we have to have these antioxidants, the fruits, the fresh fruits and the, and the water and, you know, plenty of um, water, drinking water and uh, to be able to have our liver and kidneys deal with it. So um, I ate vast amounts of fruit um, on the way to the fires, during the fires, and then after I got back. The nicest smoke to breathe was at the high altitude. Uh, actually, there was a Mendocino fire where we, we got helicoptered up to about seven or 8,000 feet near Snow Mountain, and um, there was red fur up there. Red fur only grows above about 7,000 feet. And the bark of red fur is, is very fire resistant, but it smolders when it's been burned, you know, a lot. And it had this lovely smell. I, I, I thought, this is like smoking good cigars, you know, and, and I would always breathe it up. And I now have, uh, from when I was camping in 20, 2020, I have um, up in the Sierra, I brought back a basket load that I still have of red fur bark because some people know it as the mesquite of the Sierra for putting on to the, you know, the coals, the barbecue. You know, you, you get wood going and then you put it on and, the, and that red fur bark smokes and makes it a really nice flavor. Not to be confused with red wood. Red wood, uh, we didn't do any fires where there were red, where there was red wood. Um, we only did them where there was mostly white fir, um, ponderosa pine, Jeffrey pine, Douglas fir, and um, incense cedar and things like that. My introduction to the hotshot crews was indirect. Uh, it was on our first fire in 1987, it was called the Greenville Fire, and we were actually taken across um, a reservoir in small skiffs, small boats, um, to get to it. And it, we got in, you know, we were, and this was usually what we, we were, we were known as a hand crew. And we had these tools, uh, we had uh, Pulaski, which is kind of an axe and a pick. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a single tool with an axe in one side and pick on the other, um, and shovels, and we had a sawyer with a chainsaw, uh, or two sawyers, I guess. And so we we got to this part of the, that the hotshot crews had already they had already done, you know, gone through and put down the fire. And our job was to uh, to go through the entire fire area. So. Initially, we did, you know, you cut a line with shovels and they would say, you know, we need this to be a one, you know, a 12-inch line. That was the smallest, or maybe 18-inch wide. And then we would do that all the way around a fire. We did that, I remember, at, um, up uh, in one of our first fires. It may have been on that first one. We spent all night cutting line. Uh, and um, I just remember we were, we were two crews. One set out on, in one direction to get around the fire, and we set out in the other direction. And about two or three hours later, this being our first fire, um, we could see the other crew with their lights. We had headlamps. And we're thinking, oh, man, we could see them about a quarter of a mile away. And they were getting closer, and we were getting closer. Well, it turns out it was just a peninsula of the fire, and they started heading back you know up again you know the other direction and we started heading the other direction and we cut line all night long for the next eight hours until we met you know um exhausted uh at the uh <laughs> at the far end of the fire it was a false because once you finish cutting line you can sit down and and take a nice long rest and eat and then uh, you know, after an hour or two, you get up and you just make sure all the fire, everything is out. Um, and so <laughs> that was um, our first fire, our first experience cutting line. After cutting line, then you would, we would um, do these uh, sweeps through uh, the entire fire. And uh, it was called One Glove Off. And I think I have a photo of all of us with um, showing these you know, our hands being black 
because they said, you know, get your hand down into the uh, where the fire used to be, especially these area, these places where um, a tree had burned, okay, and the stump. And um, so, you know, you have to feel, and if it's, if, it's, if it's burning hot, then you need to get in there and dig it out because these fires could uh, burn along these roots underground um, and go for 20 feet to an area that was not burned that had a lot of fuel and come up and, and, and um, light, ignite one of the roots of a tree that had not been part of the, the fire control. And, you know, a week later, these fires would, would restart from that. And so we had to uh, go around with, with uh, a glove off and, you know, lean down. It was, it was a, lot of, a lot of back work. I had worked in the weight room for uh, a, a, a year, I think, uh, before I did this um, and had recovered from the back surgery. The muscles really do, can do a lot to make up for uh, a laminectomy. And so, and I would... I, in the mornings, I would do these stretches. I just, I just had to do them in order to not tweak my back, you know, hurt my back, and I, you know, I'd be sent home and I wouldn't be able to, get, you know, earn all that money, which was, you know, three times minimum wage. And um, so I remember one time I, it was in Wyoming. It was in the the trip to Wyoming, and it was we had to get up at four in the morning. It was still dark. It was three thirty, I think. And one of the things that I did every every day, you know, I did my stretches, and then I would do a head, I'd stand on my head. <laughs> that was just part of that was my routine. I can't imagine it now, but you know, three thirty in the morning. But I would do, especially, you know, I do my abdominals, and I would do the hamstrings, and all these things, and then I would do the headstand because you, you know, it would that was one of my mainstays, uh, keeping it would strengthen your skull and strengthen, you know. And so it was pitch black, you know. So, and one of our crew members, John Leva, who I still am occasionally in touch with and who was a good friend of Sunil's and, and Anthony Kurt, uh, he walks up and he goes, what the hell? He, he didn't know what he was, it was dark. It was completely dark and my boots were in his face. My upside, my, you know, my, my feet were up there in his face. <laughs> And he goes, shit, what, what? And he looks down and he sees me and goes, geez, Lauder, what in the hell? Because <laughs> I did these before. I would get up 10 minutes before everybody else. When they said, wake up is at 4.30, I would get up at, at 4.15. I would set my little, I had a little Casio watch that um, had an alarm and I would get up. <laughs> and so he, he just could not, he couldn't, you know, I mean, it, and, and it, 4.30 in the morning and you're groggy and everything and you see these boots, you see these legs and these boots up in your face. <laughs> anyway, John, I don't know whether you remember that, but I do because of your exclamation. So anyway, getting back to the hotshot crews, because um, that was, I mean, a little digression about, you know, how hard it was on one's back. And, um, you know, that was part of the routine that I did every day to, um, you know, especially the abdominals and the stretches and everything. Because day after day, you're out there and you're stiff at the end of the day and you're stiff the next morning and you have to start um, doing this heavy work again of, you know, we were carrying, you know, pushing logs out of the way and lifting rocks and all that. And so I remember on this Greenville fire, our first fire, we went, we had to sweep um, this area and feel for any embers and there were these six foot deep holes six feet deep with with the the holes going sideways going horizontally from the um, holes and these hot shots had dug out entire tree root systems and I was just I was so impressed I mean I don't remember I never did dig a six foot deep um, I mean, I, you know, I dug down three or four feet um, to to get the, uh, the the burning roots of a tree out, but I don't remember ever doing you know six feet. Uh, and so that was my introduction to the hotshot crews. I was I was I thought, geez, these guys are are ironmen.